Welcome to the Business Spotlight. My name's uh, Gary Crosby, and I couldn't be more excited today uh, than from the opportunity to speak to Paul Chambers. He's the co-founder and COO of Poets In. It's a mental health charity. I'm not going to say anything more than that because I want Paul to explain that. So uh, thanks for spending some time with me today, Paul. Thank you for having me. Thank you for asking me on. It's been, um, it's, it will be, I'm sure, <laughs> a great pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, uh, uh, really, really chuffed to be here. Thank you. Great, great. So let's just start off, give the, the viewers a bit of context. Um, tell me what you do and how long you've, you've been doing it. Sure. So the Creative Mental Health Charity Poets In, we are a, um, a creative mental health charity that offers multiple layers of support um, to people of all ages, um, utilising creative writing, utilising the power of word, utilising um, holding a safe space, um, and we teach tools to manage well-being for life. We do this in the workplace, we do it in schools, we do it in other charities, we do it online, in person, in the community, um, and it's been super, super successful with incredible stats coming out of it, um, like measured, mm -hmm. um, measured outcomes through doing it. And we've kind of specialized over the years into um, uh, becoming the people that often schools will turn to when there's children that might not necessarily um, be responding to uh, uh, standard outlets. And, um, and, uh, it's, and we're evolving like on mm -hmm. an almost um, weekly basis and we started seven years ago in we actually started in Peterborough prison uh, right we, yeah. we, we tried what it is that we do or the embryonic version of what it is that we do now of the core the core product but we have been a charity five and a half years will be six um, September the 30th I believe um, and it's all just one big beautiful accident mm -hmm. um, that happened through myself and my 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 co-founder and we now help three and a half thousand people of all ages a year i was going to ask you that after that length of time do you have any idea about the total number of people who you've helped total well we we, we must be looking at 15 to twenty thousand that we know of yeah, yeah. um uh, and obviously there's 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 all there's always those situations where people are online for example and I'll, I'll i'll have people who i know i'm kind of linked to mm. and um when you're in person they'll be like, oh yeah i see you've been doing such and such or i saw you posted about you know managing anxiety or depression or, or, or whatever and i found it found yeah. it really useful so there's the non-vocal people that we don't know we touch but um will sometimes kind of reach out after years of kind of just quietly watching and um and it speaks volumes. It does. It does. And and I saw from your LinkedIn profile that you you'd uh, spent some time in recruitment. You spent some time in marketing. What was the um the, what was the trigger point for forming this creative mental health charity? So I was still in recruitment mm -hmm. when um kind of vaguely I'd been in recruitment for fifteen years and I was um varying degrees of success. Uh, I'd kind of reached management level and I'd take over a branch and I'd build it up and then I'd self-sabotage and then I'd move on to the next next thing right. um, for reasons which became clear. And um, and then I for, there was a kind of there was a perfect storm of things happened to me. I'd set up on my own and I'd made some bad business decisions. I had lost a cousin, I'd had to sell a house in the town I loved and moved to a small village, which at the time my lifestyle kind of didn't really, it didn't really kind of mesh with, with, with what I wanted. Mm. And I fell into a deep, dark depression um, that was sort of the beginning of my mental health journey, like knowing, knowing um, and learning about what it was that, you know, makes me tick. Yeah. And, um, and as a result of that, I kind of stepped away from the industry and I wrote a book, um, and in doing so, I got into uh, <laughs> online marketing because yeah. the because the publishers were weren't very good at by their own admission, weren't very good at marketing. I it was when it, it wasn't as toxic as it is now because we're looking at ten years ago, um, and um, and I kind of got to grips with that. I met Sammy, my co-founder, on Twitter. 
-hmm. And we we worked on the marketing for an online reading and writing community that was run by some um, American people that weren't very good at business decisions. And ultimately that was, we did what we were meant to do, which was add user, users to it because they were going to monetize it. I think it went from something like um, 1,400 to 140,000 or something ridiculous like that. It was so, oh. so long ago. Um, but they were, they were made, they were kind of going in one direction. We were going in the other. Sammy actually came up with the idea of like, why don't we harness this? We've been getting messages from people around the world showing us that giving a safe place to vent and purge would help them with their uh, mental health and help them um, with uh, suicidal thoughts. Mm. And what, was thought, the, uh, what was the book about? Just sorry to. Oh, well, the flow, book, but... the book was the book's a fiction book. Ah, OK. Yeah. It's one. And I, I have been asked recently to write a write a nonfiction book about about my my um, uh, winding, wending life. But um, it was a fiction book that, that that started in a place of anger and kind of does very much demonstrate um, how, uh, how powerful it is to have something to kind of vent and purge, mm. which is kind of what we're, we are built, built upon. And I don't necessarily stand by that book anymore because some of the language used back then i you know i'm evolving on a, mm, mm -hmm. on, a on a daily basis as, as i think a lot of us are and, are and i need to go back and rewrite it but it, it was essentially about a man who um was so obsessed with good manners that if someone was bad mannered to him he would go back and um get rid of them in in apt ways oh my word um and i ran a competition that people could die by his hand fictionally having um, done the, the thing that is their pet hate when it comes to bad manners. Oh, wow. Um, and it kind of created this, 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 um, this uh, um, energy around mm -hmm. the book and it, and it actually, it, it, it did quite well. Oh. Um, so yeah, but it was, that was a very winding road that led us to Peterborough Prison we were in there two years kind of trialing what it is that we do and kind of honing it. It was very much poetry driven then, which it isn't so much now. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can do the whole 10 week program without ever writing a poem. You can write a poem in, in every single one, but yeah. back then it was very much poetry driven, but we saw giving people an ear, giving people a voice, giving people an audience that wouldn't normally necessarily have that. Mm -hmm. um, we saw people manage addictions. We saw people manage self harm, uh, rehabilitation. But they came off um, uh, medication for, for for mental illness. Yeah, and yeah. So we've got we've got something here, um, and it was brilliant at the time. But we needed to grow, and prisoners uh, prisoners prisons can take a long time to pay mm. invoices, and we needed to uh, yeah, we needed nice. to kind of step away from that and come out into the community. So we did, and we kind of gone full circle because now we're we're, we're dealing with probation service um, amongst the many organisations who we who, who we work with. So it's been a it's been mm -hmm. a roller coaster, meandering, undulating, um, magnificent journey to get to where we are now. Which sounds great, and I, you know, I, I was thinking about what you were saying there about prisons, and I imagine that, um, and it is my imagination because I've not been into that environment, but um, that prison, the people in prison, and the other people that you might talk to may have already experienced things like um, CBT or talking therapy of d different kinds. Is there something fundamentally different about your approach to mental health that uh, has yielded so much success? I think no. I know so. There, there is. It's um, what we what we've put together is unique mm. in its in its entirety. Yes, it it, it uses um, a handful of recognised tools in the industry, but mostly speaking, it, it's put together by us. Um, and it's and so the structure it, we we have a structured program, if you like, that can run up to ten weeks, but it can, the flexibility of how it can be delivered. If you've got a group of people, the flexibility is one part because we, are, we, we aren't shackled by the constraints of, 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 I suppose, something that is is quite linear. Mm. When you've got a creative out, 
outlet, a, a creatively driven kind of um, uh, means to an outlet, um, is very much driven by the people that are on it. Hmm. So um, it's the same structure, but it'll be the same for a 12 year old as it would a, a 72 year old, you know, all the, hmm. all, all, all the way through. So the flexibility of that and the, and the fact that it, you can go in, and this was one of the lessons we learned actually, you can go into a, a, a room of, at that time it was up to about 20 people. I think 16 was, was one of my biggest groups of um, prisoners. And you'd go in there with expectations of what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. But if that vibe when you walked into that room was such that you needed to adapt to that, um, and it just be a vocal, it could be a discussion, but you end up kind of following that same that same structure. But instead of getting everyone to write and kind of be quiet, okay, we can have a debate, or we're gonna we we're gonna take it to a whiteboard, and everyone has a pen, and you know they um, they do that, or we you know we 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 do a group poem or or whatever, yeah. you know that having that flexibility, but also anyone that was delivering it, and it. And in those days, it was just myself and Sammy. Um, we both have lived experience, mm. and we're very open about our background. Mine's lived experience of, you know, uh, ADHD, depression, anxiety, um, some personality disorders, and addictions. And I'm quite, I'm quite open. No, I'm very open about that. And I think if you if you sit your stall out and you kind of before you're asking people to share you share and say, look, we're, we're not perfect. We're, mm. we're far from perfect. We've, um, we've made mistakes, you know, uh, and we appreciate that you, because by definition, a lot of the people we were working with, they, they didn't want to be there. No. And they, no. and they did want to better themselves. Um, and, and so having, having people like us deliver it and it being something completely different and enjoyable, and educational because you know the the byproduct of this was a a, a lot of people learned some skills that they wouldn't normally have mm. done um and yeah whilst it's kind of delivered as then it was like a, a poetry driven thing we saw people you know take on journalism courses um uh learn how to communicate kind of vocally and kind of mm. written you know there, there are all these positive outcomes from this from this one little beautiful thing and it um and it really worked and i think i think that's what it is it was the flexibility of it and the and the fact that we and still to this day the charity is is you know everyone that works for us has lived experience and it does very much make a difference with whoever you're talking to whatever age it's um, does it um does the group setting make a difference because i imagine again lots of people have might have had one-on-one -on -one type of you know um treatment or therapy for for the whatever condition they were uh, dealing with but the fact that you're all in a group and you've got the lived experience of the people who are delivering that uh, workshop and you've got the fact that there is a, a group of people who feel the same way is that more powerful than one-to-one -one? yes um if the psychological makeup of the person is that they they, they can handle being in a, in a group because some mm -hmm. people clearly clearly can't their anxiety might be that 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 high but there is power it's a huge amount of power um you know initially kind of getting it out of here and out of here and kind of out there mm. but that to then share it in front of other people and to see that those people you know there are there are correlations there are crossovers there are people that have been through similar or are still going through similar things and the and the camaraderie that comes from that the, the sense of kind of community that comes from that in this mm. quite quite transient group because you know people would come and go for obvious reasons because some some would some would finish finish in the prison some would be transferred um, and some some would leave but there was this, you know core group that would for the most part stay the same and to have week on week the the permission to share and be listened to mm. and to kind of like gradually open up like a like a like a flower and feel safe to do so yeah so so powerful and um as a result it you know it, it it's we we saw these incredible things happen that's where we kind of implemented measurements matrix i can never say that correctly <laughs> um 
and and as a result we've got you know seven years of um measured results of you know in the high 90 percent of success of people having a reduction in depression anxiety um i I've, still think to, to this day 100 percent of people that have been on our programs have said that it's been useful to them mm. which and you know I, yeah mind blown by that but i think about my own coaching and i sometimes say to business owners you know think on paper um because as soon as those thoughts are outside your head you'll see them in a, in a completely different way and i know that obviously Absolutely. there's a lot of stuff going on around uh, the power of journaling and things like that just tell me a bit more about you know what the the creative part of it is the poetry or the written prose how do you use that to, to help people so we um there are there are various kind of outlets if if you like and the vehicles can kind of differ but but um as it's, it's wonderful that you say that and you recognize that because yes of course like getting it out there yeah. is it, you know once it's out there that's it's something tangible and palpable to to mm. deal with and do something with and kind of and work through and cross out and kind of add to and like there's there, there's beauty in that so yes we um we teach about journaling mm -hmm. and the fact that it doesn't have to be perfect um it doesn't have to be these things that people see on on social media where yeah. everything is absolutely beautiful it doesn't have to be that at all no. um we start each session with um an activity where we just for 10 minutes give people permission to sit with their thoughts and write them down exactly as they're coming through their head in that haphazard chaotic way that it can be anything from you know i've got to uh, speak to that person today i'm really hungry i've got to get some milk later on some song lyrics will kind of uh, skitter across your brain then i really need the toilet it's hot in here you know they because yeah. our thoughts are constant but to tap into those and recognize them for what they are but then what you do with them, apart from if you need to keep anything, you tear it up. And the therapy and the catharsis in that. It's so simple. It's so ridiculously wow. simple to do. But it's it's like it demonstrates perfectly what it is that we're, we're about because it, it's like a leveler. Um, I don't know if you get this, um, but if I wake up, three, it's always 3 or 4 a.m. And even if I'm not worrying about anything, my brain just kind of clicks in. Yes. It just starts, and yeah. to then get that down on paper can be it's it's um, it's unraveling what's in your head so you don't become unravelled. Mm. Mm. Um, and so so that's like a real a real um, sim simple version. We teach the worry diary, which is a tool. It's a very powerful tool. It saved my life when I was in a really really dark place, and it um, it if you uh, struggle with anxiety, overthinking, catastrophizing, insomnia, you know, uh, uh, just being overwhelmed, it's normally because you're worrying. And that worrying comes in the form of two kind of types of thoughts. There's the um, there's worries you could do something about the ones you can't, which mm -hmm. are practical and hypothetical. The hypothetical ones make all the noise and they stop you getting on with your simple day to day tasks. But you could have three. I mean, if you imagine a to do list with only three things on, imagine that. But, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <One> day. <laughs> but you, you know, uh, even that would be too much to kind of uh, face. So what it does is it it teaches you, um, and you can just Google uh, Worry Diary. You can download it for free from our website, an electronic, uh, electronic copy of it. But um, there's a lot written about it because it's so, so powerful, so, so simple, because it, it's effectively putting aside time each day to worry. Mm -hmm. After writing down your worries throughout the course of the day, you sit down, and you work your way through them and you acknowledge and digest why you can't do something about something and you deal with it. And wow. yeah. and in doing so, the simplicity of that, you know, they don't go away overnight, but it has an accumulative nature, a bit like, you know, we all have physical health and we all have mental health. Physical health, we know if we go to the gym once, we'll feel great, but it won't have a long-term effect. No. Worry Diary is one piece of apparatus in the gym for our mental health that if you do it for two weeks, those hypothetical noisy worries will gradually, the what ifs that you can't do anything about, that mm. gradually um, uh, dissipate and you can get on with the, I've got to ring someone, I've got to get the car sorted out. You know, those things that are overwhelming, mm. but so simple. So um, there's that. We write goodbye letters to depression, which sounds 
so ridiculously um, uh, uh, hippy dippy, but honestly, it's like it's just it's a beautiful exercise where you are literally breaking up with them. And again, we understand it doesn't go away, but in doing things like that and all of these different layers of tools that we teach and being in a safe place, we hold a you know, if you're on a six week course, it's the same people each week over mm. those six weeks mm. and you flourish in front of people and you share and you come out lighter with tools that you can use for life and pass on to others who, um, who are, who are struggling. So and what do people get from, um, you know, sitting in a room or in a workshop, like you said, for six weeks or longer and looking around the room and thinking, um, it's not just me. That must be oh, cool, right. The, the, the power in that, the, because the nature of mental health is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, you, particularly with anxiety and depression, you turn yourself into an island um, mm. and you think that everyone else has got their lives together and you haven't. You think everyone else's life is perfect and you haven't. And to, um, to find the strength in in others saying the same thing and realizing you aren't alone. Um, that just that initial, the initial getting it out there is mm. powerful. But then some saying, oh yeah, I get that. Do you ever do this, 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 and this? And, yeah, I do that. Oh my God, I thought I was alone. And and you can see it spreading through all oh, the hair, the hairs are going up on my arms even. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even talk talking about it. it in my in my back of my neck as well. Yeah. Oh, it's it, it's just wonderful to see see like the light go on in people's eyes and realise that they aren't alone and they're not struggling or they don't have to struggle um, in kind of a solo capacity. When I first very, very first reached out and got some help and I, I had an initial call with a with a um, with a private counsellor and um, the moment she said you know this is one of the this is one of the most common things that um, people contact me with first of all hmm. it sounds like you're depressed and those few words I just I just I just broke, broke apart um, mm. but mm. knowing you're not because particularly if you're my age, I mean, you're clearly at least 20 years younger than me, but, um, but I've got the zoom but, filter on max. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, we, we, we've grown up with, um, with depictions in, uh, uh films and TV of, you know, padded cells mm. and, um, of, uh, you know, the word psycho, like all of these, all of this stigma that's attached to, um, mental illness where, yeah. whereas in actual fact it is so commonplace it's it's unusual for people not to be managing something and so that in a very long-winded way the power of um uh, uh that group therapy if you like mm. it isn't therapy but that group kind of th there is therapy that you get from it and there's catharsis and that you get from it um by sharing in front of people and I imagine there's there's some people who you know they've got doors in the corridors of their mind that they would just rather keep shut. Do you think it's for everyone the the you know the 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 sharing and the and the acknowledgement and the acceptance of of what you're feeling versus what must have been you know the, the old British stiff upper lip? I'm going <laughs> to lock that away and and yeah. that's it. I'm never going to go back there. How do you reconcile those two positions? Well, I I can only. Well, I can't only, but first of all, I have to say, we don't make anyone talk about anything they're not comfortable talking no. about. No. We we give them the tools, we give them the time, and we give them the encouragement and the the support to do so. And, you know, um, we will say to them, if you, if you don't want to read it out, we'll read it out for you. If you don't want it read out, can I read it? Just so there's that element of sharing. But, you know, there are the doors that will remain closed. Um, because people just aren't ready so there are further levels that we can go to if say say they're, say they're on a six-week course and they want to explore it further because they've felt comfortable but they haven't felt comfortable opening those doors in front of other people yeah. we've got extra layers of help that we can we can add to that now that stiff upper lip thing that man up thing that pull your socks up and get 
and get on with it thing. It was something I very much subscribed to um, for a lot of my life mm-hmm. and became an alcoholic and a drug addict um, mm-hmm. as a result because I was just numbing what I wasn't dealing with inside. And um, I went down a very unhealthy, unhealthy route. So we encourage, we don't force, um, and, and the extra, the extra layers of support we can do, we can do on a one-to-one basis. We can do with different people. If like, you know, my energy doesn't, um, sit well with someone because they might be very, um, very introverted, even though, you know, I'm, I'm okay dealing with, with yeah. introverted people, but they might need someone like we've got someone on our team called Helen who talks very softly um, and is a life coach as well as working for us. And, you know, that's what they will respond to. So, yeah. Yeah, um, and we can sometimes just be the stepping stone to them exploring um, uh, more kind of standard um avenues of support if there's so you know if there's some real high level trauma um ptsd or something and that environment isn't right often we've kind of a bit like i did way back then i've Mm. I've tried so many different things and you just kind of you it's like a positive gateway drug um and it leads you to other kind of positive Mm. things that that are going to um open those doors when you feel ready to open them mm. but we don't kick them down <laughs> yeah yeah in my discussion this morning um uh, on adhd there was a, a question about the medicalization of of this kind of um you know condition if you like and there's this question that i've got in my mind about the difference between uh, the work that you do and the way that you encourage people to share and the way you encourage people to get the thoughts out of themselves and be visible in front of them versus what might be considered to be a you know, a, a medical practice, if you like, of actually just administering drugs. Do you find there's a, a dilemma between those two in, in your work? Um, yes. And I think there are benefits to both. Mm-hmm. Um, and that when I say both, they can be individually or even um, a, a, a culmination of the two. Now, I'm not on meds for my ADHD, but I am in the envious position of being able to i i go out and i talk in schools i talk i'm uh tomorrow i'm going off to cardiff and i'm presenting at um a big seminar and awards thing there and the talking about it and extolling the virtues of leaning into these things that can sometimes be a superpower and they can sometimes be an absolute ball and chain around your um uh ankle particularly if you're trying to do spreadsheets um then you know there are times i wish i could i could just i could just pop a pill and kind of uh, 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 and make this 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 uh, mm. a plateau of, of how i'm feeling but for the most part um i am for both i think it should be explored a lot more with alternate personally mm-hmm. um uh, i think it should be explored more the alternative routes and the and the talking out because it, you know if you can we've seen people manage heroin addictions we've seen people manage the the highest level of self harm ever just through having an outlet mm. that can can um, uh, flatten those spikes that come with ADHD yeah um, yeah it's uh, there's there's benefits to both but uh, what I what I can say is when I go to the schools and I did uh, four in a Luton. I was in Spain last week, but the week, week, mm. week before I did four assemblies and I start my assembly with like introduction about me. And then, oh, and by the way, I have ADHD and OCD. So part of me wants this to be absolutely perfect. But the other part of me is in no way, shape or form psychologically built to deliver anything like it. So uh, strap mm. in, it's going to be a bumpy ride and I will be messing up. Yes. And just that sentence of of giving myself permission in front of hundreds of people to cock up Mm -hmm. uh, and that it's okay to do so Uh, the feedback we get from from that in particular just seeing someone with adhd and i I, and i think kind of normalizing it that normalizing might lead to people not 
instantly say, I need a pill. Uh, you know, and, yeah. and again, if that works for you, great. Mm. But I think, um, you know, try other things first if you can. Mm. And, and do these conditions, I mean, are they, uh, I don't know, I don't really want to use the word cure, but is there a point at which the relevant treatment, the relevant therapy, the relevant um, understanding, the relevant uh, acknowledgement and acceptance of the condition itself leads to something akin to, um, you know, ha living life without the condition, if, if you like? Um, yes, for the most part. Um, and I think, I think if you, if you are in positions like you know again i'm lucky i'm a co-founder of my own charity so i can kind of work to my to my ups and downs yeah. um because i understand them and everyone understands me i understand them so uh, so i'm in a workplace where i can i mm. can do the things that can virtually result in in me being back to normal mm. um whereas others can't but I think with the right knowing, knowing your truth, and this is one of the things I say over and over again, knowing your truth is so key mm. within any role, knowing your truth, knowing your red flags, knowing, knowing as much about you as you can see something's going to go wrong soon if you don't do something about it. Yeah. That can get you as close to that stage as you can possibly get whilst being neurodiverse. Got it. So so many years of great work going on um what's what lies ahead for the charity in terms of your um ability to provide these amazing services to to more people what do you want to achieve we there's there's two particular kind of um uh, uh directions we are focusing very much on um what one's my my kind of very much my pet project because i want to be the person i didn't know i needed so schools are very much a key focus um whether that's funded through kind of local local government mm. or um or through um schools being able to access funding and kind of uh yada 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 but kind of getting it early early on yeah. spreading the word and kind of <coughs> excuse me as much as possible um uh, teaching these tools, but also teaching the teachers these tools so that they can in turn kind of pass it on, which we are hoping is going to lead ultimately to licensing. Mm -hmm. Because okay. we have teachers, teachers do a great job. And my God, I, I'm, I'm so impressed by them after going in schools as an adult, I see what yeah. they, what they, what they have to deal with on a daily basis. And you've got a thousand kids in one building. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to not, uh, to kind of like manage everyone's everyone's needs so so that's one of the elements and then we've got a well-being in the workplace which is something which is you know, in all honesty because we're a charity a lot of our funding is from uh grants funding and donations all of which are have been hit hard by cost of living and um, a lot more organizations going for a lot less money so where there is an element of uh, growth needed or potential growth we're gonna we are going to be pushing um our product of well-being in the workplace we're we're currently recruiting for a salesperson to do so to look at the private sector right. um which you know they have the mindset of paying for these things mm -hmm. as i'm sure you know mm -hmm. um, and anything from just some um collateral for the hr team to send out through to a whole mental health um uh what's this survey if you like to see where everyone is with everything and kind of and, and on the back of that uh, um a tailor-made support and uh and training package on the back of that so mm -hmm. so those are those are our that's how we're kind of future proofing ourselves if you like over the next few years which are going to be tight mm -hmm. We are looking at um, at that, and personally, I'm doing a 79 mile walk for suicide awareness. So, um, uh, which uh, is is as it approaches, it's in September and Suicide Awareness Week, and um, and but it really is more for awareness and to kind of lift um, lift the conversation about it and normalise that because mm. uh, the 79 is the amount by the end of last year. That's the amount of 
men that were taking their lives um, each week in England. Um, so 79 miles around Chiltern Hills, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of talk to people where uh, we're going to be on heart radio and um, uh, various other things. Um, in so a one there's 79 miles. Sorry? In a one there's 79 miles. Uh, sorry, I still didn't hear that. In, in a one you're going you're to set off and walk for 79 miles in one go? Or oh, no, over, no, 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 days. no. Over, over five days, otherwise I'd never do it. <laughs> so, I was I was bowing down with great respect. <laughs> no, no, I've had a bad back all my life, so so I'm a, I'm in I'm in a real a lot of training at the moment for this. Yeah, didn't yeah. realize didn't quite realize the undertaking. It was just going to be me wanting to do a challenge, but mm. you know these. Uh, but this is how we this is how we lift. Mm. Um, we lift the conversation. We lift the um, the focal mm. focal point around the charity. What's most important to you in in uh, fundraising? Then, I mean, do you get companies to have you as their charity of the year? Is there a particular focus there on getting people to, you know, focus on you for the for the twelve month period? Yes, um, there's that. So we we have um, we have a bank that's recently chosen us as their as a charity, Red, Redwood Bank. So, mm -hmm. um, which is brilliant for us, and they you know they in turn yeah. will get access to. Um, our services as well, but we are also looking at um, uh, sponsorship of uh, a six-week program, for example, for eight people that uh, you know can be stamped Acme Anvils. I'm going into road Roadrunner territory here, but <laughs> I uh, yeah, <laughs> Acme Anvils like have sponsored this 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 mental health um, uh, workshop that yeah. you know that will be delivered in the in the community. So. So there's, you know, there's various ways that people can can support mm. us or if, if they want to do a virtual walk alongside us or join in with us, mm -hmm. you know, there are multiple ways that they can support us. Do you have um, ambassadors for the charity? We do indeed. We've got, um, we, we've got, I, I was actually talking to her this morning, a local artist by the name of Sarah Graham. Um, she's a... Uh, she, she does ultra detailed kind of paintings. I don't know how human beings can do these these paintings, but yeah. she um, she has had extreme uh, bipolar to actually having psychosis and being. Now I always get this word word incorrect, and this is my ADHD because I've got fifty it, committed, committed, committed. Yeah. Um, and she gave away all these paintings that were tens of thousands of pounds, but um, in the like just for just for a taxi ride to get somewhere, like no, she just she untethered from from normality. She's been clear for many years now. She's um, she's a she's an ambassador for the organisation, and she's just doing something with Samaritans and with us. Mm -hmm. um, we've got um, some other people that like uh, oh, actually yes, a, a favourite author of mine, Michael Marshall Smith um actor um called miles chapman um and various other people this will be formalized soon when mm -hmm. mr adhd gets around to um uh, getting all the paperwork out and um sorting mm. it mm. so let's just think about it from uh, just um a question from a business perspective if you like um because i'm thinking obviously you're running a, a charity but the processes inside the charity will be very business-like Yes. If you could go back to the beginning and just um, give your starting self some good advice about running the charity in a business-like way, what would you what would you say to yourself? Um, from a, from a business perspective, I would go back and say, Paul, Sammy, be flexible because um, things can change in. A, on a sixpence to use an old, old, yeah. old term. just look at the pandemic. Um, the, uh, it, you know, it, it was, if you didn't adapt in that situation, you could have fallen, fallen by the wayside. So, mm. so be, be flexible and get out there and talk because people buy from people, no matter what the product is. Um, even if that's a charity, uh, you, you know, get out there, hold your head high, because we were very apologetic in the early stages because both of us were terrible at asking mm. for money, believe it or not, even though I was in recruitment, yeah. um, I was always an honest re recruiter. Now, 
from a personal point of view in business, um, I would have said to myself, understand your mental health, learn how to manage that and kind of lean into the superpowers and mm. avoid the avoid the um, avoid the spreadsheets um, yep. and just and just get up in front of the people and talk like know your worth. Mm. And that actually from, from from both sides, my my per, my personal perspective and the charity, knowing your worth is is so key because mm. we because we didn't we were so we were genuinely apologetic which comes from anxiety and it comes from depression it comes from um the mental health backgrounds that we had uh, and and the, and the bitter irony in that when you're when you're launching something and wanting to grow it and you're like oh, oh, do you mind awfully if i yeah. if i ask you for some money yeah, that's ridiculous but that's brilliant advice for business owners generally and it's a particular challenge that you faced, but I still find a lot of people, particularly those who come out of successful careers and something else and set themselves up in business, they have a real challenge with asking for money, deciding what their fair value is for their product or service. And for many, it takes years and years and years before they've got yeah. the confidence to say, and I charge that, and that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. With no advice. question mark on the end, where, and I charge that? Uh, mm. No, I charge that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. People respect that, I think. So, um, Paul, I could talk to you all afternoon, but um, we're going to have to bring it to a close. But so I just wanted to ask you one final question, which was around, you know, what's coming up with the charity? What do you want people to know about what's happening for the rest of the year? You've mentioned the walk and things like that. Is there anything else that you want um, to share before we wrap up? Um, no, if you, if, you, if you keep an eye out on our website, poetsin.com, um, there are a lot of um, things coming up aside from my walk, mm -hmm. but um, but I've managed to delete all of them from my head, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I can't remember them right now. So um, so dot uh, com. Yes, and and um, and reach out whether you're a business wanting to utilise us, whether you're a school that your your pupils want to use us, or you yourself want to um, self refer. Uh, we're here for you. Fabulous. What a great way to finish. Um, Paul, I'm, I'm inspired by, by what you've said, and I'm really pleased I had the chance to meet you and to listen to that uh, story. Once again, thank you so much for spending some time with me this afternoon. Thank you so much, Gary. It's been um, a, an honour and a pleasure. Thank you so much.